Welcome, this is Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A show. If you've got any questions, we give you the answers. Uh, get your questions into the email address on the screen right there, or in the comments below, just make sure and use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Let's get involved. Casper Nielsen. Hi Dodd, I'm wondering, since my new bike came set up tubeless uh, for a while now, I'm wondering if tubeless sealant could contaminate brake pads when installing the tyre or just perhaps if I've got a puncture on the trail. I've seen sealant splash around in many odd ways and over bikes and wheels. Um, I've never seen this being addressed. Could you enlighten me? Um, I don't think it would contaminate your brake pads in a sort of a, a bad way like you would get with oil, which can be almost catastrophic for them really. Um, Anything on your brake pads isn't ideal. You know, you're gonna get water on them when you're riding, you're gonna get mud and stuff like that. A lot of cleaners are brake pad safe. I don't think the, the latex inside sealant is really gonna have any adverse effect on them. Uh, and if it did, it would be very short term until it burnt off when you're using it. It's not like an oil where it's actually gonna uh, soak into the brake pads and ruin them. So no, I think you're fine. Just try not to get too much stuff near your brake pads really. Try and keep them as clean and unaffected by anything as possible. I've got a RockShox Reba 2019 and had a remote lockout on the bars which got ripped off in a crash. Is there any way I could put a normal twist lock lockout on the top of the fork? Thanks, Will. Um, as far as I know, you can't just replace the dial on the fork because of the way the lockout works. I think you have to replace the actual damper, which in your case, I believe, is something like this that has a cable operation on the top. If I'm right, then the part you need I think they're about 45 quid. Now you could just order one of those, you literally unscrew it and you drop in the new one. It will have your regular three position dial on the top as opposed to your cable operated one. Um, you can check the parts that are available for your fork there on the RockShox website. There's a part number on your fork that will correlate to that. Or you could ring up someone uh, like a suspension tuner or a RockShox authorized dealer and they will be able to just tell you over the phone. It's not rocket science, it's a fairly simple process. Um, a little bit annoying for the amount of money it costs, but if you sound like you've broken that, you need to either repair that or get a new one anyway. I wouldn't be surprised if the new remote top cap units cost the same price as that. So um, yeah, check that one out. Good luck. All right, next up from Phaser96. Hello, love your videos. Thanks, Phaser. I've got a 2018 RockShox Pike and the lockout doesn't seem to work right. All three clicks feel the same and even fully locked out, it still feels the same as though it's in the fully open position. Any tips on how I can fix the lockout? Does it just need to be serviced? I guess it does depend on the model you've got, but there's definitely an issue with yours somewhere there. It could just be, for example, this is a damper from inside. I think this one's from a Lyric, um, but fundamentally they work on the same principle. This one has a three position clicker on the top here. Um, it could be possible that the actual top cap is not engaging with the rod on the inside that moves. Um, just so you can see for reference there, you can see that rod moving there. There's a series of ports on the inside of that. Uh, lets different amounts of oil flow through it, like far less when it's screwed down all the way to resist movement and far more when it's fully open so it's not hindered in any way. Um, it definitely sounds like something is not quite right inside your fork. I really can't tell without seeing it or playing with it myself. Uh, your best bet is to look up that model and see, like, uh, look up the model number that's on the back of your fork there. You can sometimes find out information if you just type it into Google, see if there's been any sort of uh, warranty issues with the damper unit in yours. If not, ring up your nearest suspension tuner. If you're in the UK, there's a whole number. There's Sprung, there's uh, there's TF Tuned, there's, there's, there's loads out there, and I'm sure there will be wherever you are too. Uh, and they should be able to talk you through a way to find what the problem is on yours over the phone. And then if you need to, they'll get you booked in and get it fixed for you. Um, hopefully you get that serviced and get that sorted out, because that shouldn't be happening. It's a very good fork, that. Okay, Bad Larry has got a, um, well, I don't know if this is a question or if this is just a, a thing, I think it's a thing. Regarding retro tech, we all remember the crud catcher. We certainly do, I have the very first one uh, that came off the production line, in fact. Uh, for those of you who don't know the crud catcher, even though uh, Bad Larry says we all remember that, um, it was basically a mud fender that fitted on a down tube of the bike, catching a spray that would come up towards your face. Um, now these were really effective back in the day, they still are, but less so perhaps than they are these days because we have a big gap at the front of our bikes between the fork crown and the tire, and that mud can go out there and you ride back into it at speed. Back in the day when everyone was using crud catches, you used to have like rigid forks, or certainly forks are a lot lower, so that gap was so small that not much spray would get out of that gap into your face. Um, anyway, but do you remember the crud claw? Um, 
from the same people. Yes, it was from the same person. Uh, that person, his name is Pete Tompkins. A uh, bit of a genius by all accounts. Um, a very gutsy man. One of my favorite people in the bike industry. Um, I had one on my 90s Marin that got pinched, or Marin, uh, but I can't, can't remember it vividly. It was like a comb with an alloy part attached to your back axle with a prong between a gap and a cassette. Bit of a mad idea. Um, yeah, so if you don't know what one of these are, there's one on screen right now. It's exactly that. It's an alloy prong. You used to take off the end of your quick release for your rear wheel. This is how long ago this was. You used the nut end of the quick release to hold it in place, and it basically had a comb that would go in between the sprockets of your rear cassette. Now in the UK, we're used to doing cross country riding and you ride across fields and stuff like that with really thick mud and your cassettes would get so much mud on them, they'd just, they'd just turn into like a big sort of volcano shape lump of mud and the chain would just spin around on them. So by having this comb on there, it would scrape the mud out from, from the gap in between them as you're riding, um, therefore making your bike rideable even in the worst mud. But it's funny, I don't, I don't you know, it used to be a problem back then. Maybe just transmissions weren't as superior as they are now because I don't find that's a problem these days. Here and there you ride in really sticky mud and it can become a problem, but far less than I remember it being when I was first riding. So I'm gonna do a bit of research into finding out why actually and see why, why stuff has got so much better. Um, I'll continue reading, sorry. By the way, that bike also had the red elastoma version of the Gervin Flex Stem from your set. From your set, uh, it's a wonder the thief didn't bring the bike back when you think about it. Um, yeah, so the the Flex Stem, basically the one we've got on the tech set, you can see it right here. That's got a green elastoma on it. That's the softest, I think. The red was a medium, and I think they had a black one. I'm going to say was the firm one. Different durometers of rubber, like we have durometers of rubber on tires to effectively have a soft, medium, and firm spring. Um, awful product. Um, but I love it somehow um, because that was one. Of, that was my first suspension product I ever owned. I had one and uh, couldn't afford a fork at the time, so basically you'd buy a flex stem. And that was your first entrance into the world of suspension. Although that was definitely aimed around comfort, it didn't offer any sort of uh, any traction or any advantages that a suspension fork would offer. But it didn't change your frame geometry, which is something that everyone loved about them back in the day. However, it was strange going over bumps and your brake levers would move around, and if you had bar ends, they would move around as well. But kind of cool. Just a bit weird, I guess. Um, cheers for that, by the way. I'm gonna tell you the story all about Pete Tompkins, the man who invented the crud catcher, I'll tell you about how he did that and how that translates to what he's doing now. It's pretty cool. Uh, we'll pick that one up on a tech set and a tech show soon. Over to Lee Campion now. I just finished watching the Dirt Shed show when you had been talking about trends and you mentioned um, the high pivot point in the chain going over it. Then I also remembered Neil reviewed a Canyon stitched 720 at Whistler. Um, that and a few other slope style bikes have the pivot point at the bottom bracket so the chain stays at the same length. Um, with that said, wouldn't manufacturers take that into consideration when designing frames, or would that kind of pivot point have an effect on how a suspension works and feels? Um, yeah, okay, okay, so using the slope style analogy, so that pivot point known as a concentric pivot that goes, rotates around the bottom bracket. Now the idea behind that is the fact the chain stay doesn't change in length, therefore the chain doesn't change in length, which means you can run them single speed if you want to. So for a slope style bike that's only gonna have around three inches of rear wheel travel, sometimes four inches, uh, let's just say 100 millimeters for argument's sake, um, it's a great idea. So you can have the bike that feels like a hardtail, performs like a hardtail, it's gonna be nice and robust if you cr or when you crash for that sort of riding. Um, you can do all your tricks on it, you don't have to worry about the transmission on there, uh, and you can set it up single speed. So it works fantastically for them with that small amount of travel, because those guys, let's face it, they run those bikes almost rock hard. They don't really need the suspension, it's kind of, it's there for when they do make an error that they've got that sort of uh, margin of error. Now the downside to having a concentric pivot is the fact that when you're using one a slightly longer travel bike, they're very, very active. So this is both a great thing and also a slight problem. Because they're so active, you also have to take into consideration how they feel when you pedal. So we have seen, and over the years, we've seen Rotex downhill bikes, we've seen various other manufacturers take on the concentric pivot onto certain platforms. And whilst they do offer a lot of an active feel, you have to control it a lot more with other parts of the suspension design, which goes against having it work like that in the first place. So the more travel you have, the more calming the shock has to do, or the more clever the manufacturer has to be with their linkage in order to tune the way that the shock lets it handle. Now, pedaling platform bikes is one good idea of how that used to be. So you'd see bikes that like the fifth element shock. In fact, I think Cove used to make a bike, fairly short, it's called the G-Spot, and it had one of those concentric pivots. And since then, people, I mean, I think Specialized used a concentric pivot on their downhill bike um, a couple of seasons back. 
but the whole point of that bike is to be active and to hug the ground and do all that stuff. You know, um, how they pedal is almost the least part of the equation, whereas the bikes you use on everyday riding, they have to be efficient, they have to work well in all situations. So therefore, it's a very slight trade-off amongst how, how, how much chain growth there is. Some manufacturers use the chain growth to their advantage, um, how well it pedals, how well the suspension works, and they all vie to, when I say all, all the manufacturers vie to have the best overall performance. That's what you can look for in a suspension bike. Um, but I do like the concentric thing as far as short travel bikes goes, because it's neat and it works. And there we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. Uh, don't forget to ask questions in the comments below. Use those hashtags, Ask GMBN Tech. And for another cool video, click down here to see everything about how a tire is made. This is going from tree to trail. Um, I think this process is pretty cool actually. So check that video out. Let us know what you thought of that video in the comments below that video. And don't forget to click, share, subscribe, and give us a huge thumbs up. Cheers.